Hey there, listeners. It's Shane. And Ishan, your hosts from the Total Party Thrill Podcast, the newest addition to the Don't Split the Podcast Network. We talk topics that help you, dear listener, create and play better RPG games. We have a back catalog of more than 150 weekly episodes. And we got nominated for an Emmy for episode 11, Social Contracts. In episode 154, we talked about crossing the moral event horizon. How evil is too evil? We also recap our home games, like the 40k Rogue Trader campaign, Dynasty Unwarranted. I mean, that's mainly just you trying to kill us all. In your defense, our characters are greedy idiots. Don't forget the three years we spent never on playing Morning Glory, your 5th edition D&D campaign. We also review new RPGs and books, and every episode we build a 5th edition D&D character in the Character Creation Forge. You might check out the pint-sized Punisher from episode 119, a halfling with a bad attitude, and 14 levels of Barbarian. So to recap, total party thrill. RPG advice, campaign recaps, and D&D characters built by your dashing hosts every single week. What more could you possibly want? To get back to the actual show? Oh yeah, let me just hit this button, and here you go. This is Tabletop Babble. I'm James Intercasso. Today on the show, Sursa Victory has returned to talk about puzzles. Puzzles and traps, but really puzzles. Uh, If you missed our first conversation about traps, it is really, really good. I recommend you go back and take a listen to that one, and then you can listen to me and Sursa talk about puzzles, or vice versa, honestly. They both work. They go hand in hand. You can listen to them in any order. It is a really, really fun chat. He is such a smart game designer. I wish I had his brain. So here is my conversation with him. Okay, everybody, now I am here with a genius game designer, uh, a person who has won many worthy accolades. Sirs of Victory, welcome back to Tabletop Babble. Uh, for people who don't know, who are you and what do you do in the world of tabletop role-playing games? Yeah, thanks for having me back again for what, I don't know, the fifth, sixth time. It's always it's always super fun. <laughs> um, yeah, my name is Sirs of Victory. I'm an independent game designer that specializes in Death Trap Dungeons and Tournament Dungeons. Um, my most recent work includes two modules for Kobold Press called Tomb of Mercy and Necropolis of the Mailed Fist. And of course, my self-published Testament of Malice, which was a free book of traps. Yeah, and last time you were on, we talked all about traps and we talked about Testament of Malice. Um, and people really, really liked that podcast. Uh, I really enjoyed that podcast and learned a lot while I was talking to you. So I'm glad that you're back because now we're going to sort of continue our conversation about traps, but also how they relate to puzzles and things like that. And, uh, you know, they go hand in hand. Um, they can be very frustrating to design. They can be very, when not designed well, not very fun to play through. So let's like get into it a little bit uh, because you are putting together puzzles and traps in a product. You're going to be talking about that, right? And something you have upcoming. Yeah, so I'm working on a new book. Uh, this is my first product for DMs Guild, and it's called Tournament Dungeon Handbook. And as the name implies, it is a, a handbook for folks who want to run tournament dungeon delves, and whether that's something at a big convention like Gen Con, or if you're pitting your friends against one another at home. Um, it covers kind of three major topics. The first is organizing a tournament, the logistical piece, like finding a venue, getting prizes, those sorts of things, on over to designing a tournament and that kind of gets into some of the nitty-gritty about puzzles and traps and encounters and things like that and then of course actually running it and keeping the pace nice that's great that's like a an awesome three-tiered book that people can use for design but also for running games which i think is really important because a lot of times uh, there are a lot more people running tournament dungeons than there are designing them too right the consistency when you're running a tournament is more important than consistency when you're just sort of running an organized play adventure that isn't necessarily a tournament. So that's also important. Let's dive into this. Uh, Puzzles, traps, how are they related? Yeah, so as I mentioned in part one of uh, our conversation about traps, um, there's sort of three three ways that ideally you should be placing traps in a dungeon. Uh, The first one that I mentioned was sort of as uh, an accompaniment to monsters and encounter, right? They're sort of visible from the beginning and they complicate the player's tactics. Um, The second, of course, was sort of a twist in an encounter. So those first two are very encounter-centric. The third way to place traps, and I think this is kind of the most common and the most interesting, is as part of a a puzzle, right? And 
the way that I've been thinking about puzzles recently is they're kind of broken up into three different parts. So I'm going to get a little bit theoretical with you, if you indulge me. So in my mind, a puzzle is composed of three parts. Uh, the first is what's called the affordance. So it's something that you can interact with in the dungeon where it's obvious to the players that they can interact with it, but the correct means of interaction is unclear. Right. And, and these are sort of the scenes that are pretty iconic in the dungeon delve uh, genre, which is you come into a room and there's a pedestal, right? And you know, okay, something's got to go on that pedestal. We know there's a, it's an, it's an affordance. We know we can interact with this thing. We know we got to put something on the pedestal, but we don't know what. So that's the first piece. There's some kind of thing interactable. There's the affordance. There's also the reward, right? So every puzzle should have some sort of reward for solving it. And that seems to make sense, right? Um, what's the point of solving a puzzle for no reward? And rewards can be explicit. So the players may be able to see the reward as they enter the chamber. Maybe they can see there's already an item on the pedestal. And the puzzle is how do we solve whatever things going on in this room so it can claim the item. Uh, or it can be implied, right? So for example, there may be some kind of puzzle on a door. They know that solving the puzzle will open the door and give them some kind of, uh, some kind of benefit, but they don't know what it is. But the presence of the puzzle implies the reward, right? And then the third, of course, is the punishment. We have the affordance, we have the reward, which can be explicit or implicit, and we have the punishment, which can be also explicit or implicit. And basically the punishment is what happens when the players try to solve the puzzle incorrectly. Um, and that serves kind of a couple different purposes. The first, of course, is to keep the players from brute forcing it, right? If you can just kind of constantly solve the puzzle or try to solve the puzzle with no repercussions and it's not really that fun you can sort of brute force and go okay well let's just press every button or pull pull every lever or do whatever right so it really kind of forces the players um, to think about the action that they're about to take because there is going to be some sort of consequence for solving the puzzle incorrectly and that's the trap right the other part is it sort of lends um i mean it's it's thematic we talked about this a bunch last time which is that's honestly those are the moments that i think define dungeoneering is that you've got, it's that Indiana, I know we keep coming back to it every single podcast. We always talk about Indiana Jones or Castlevania or something, but you know, <laughs> it's that moment of there's, there's the idol on the pedestal and you, and you know that you're going to get one shot at this to, to pull that idol off of the pedestal. And if you screw it up and something bad's going to happen and that's exciting. Right. Um, and then of course, as I mentioned, you know, traps are always a way to reinforce the theme of your dungeon. So you've got kind of three things going on, right? You've got, this sort of mechanical like sort of game design aspect of we want to sort of prevent the players from running roughshod over the challenges. So let's force them to, to make a hard choice, you know? And then of course you've got like the thematic bit, which is the nature of the trap will create excitement and reinforce the theme of the dungeon. So yeah, just to quickly summarize, like those are the three things, the affordance, uh, the reward, and then of course the, uh, the punishment. Totally. Yeah, exactly. And when you tie those things together, you're already making things more interesting, right? Because uh, like you said, you can't just brute force your way through. It's not like, well, we'll just sit here and try every combination on this lock until we eventually find it. That's never fun. <laughs> and part of it too is it sets the players up um, for the expectation that the trap is going to be there. I mean, the number one question that people have, I think, about traps is how do I make them not feel like gotchas? And, and the answer to that question is that you put them in, in contexts where it's really clear to the players that there's going to be a trap. And so that's, you know, when you see a puzzle and you see, okay, here's a, oh, here's a door and there's three slots for gems and there's six gems. You're like, oh Christ, like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like the, the, the players aren't going to come. I mean, they may, they may find the puzzle boring or they may struggle, you know, with other parts of your dungeon, but they're not going to complain that they didn't know that there was going to be a trap, you know, like they knew that there was some kind of interaction. Totally. Um, yeah. yeah. And that kind of goes back to another kind of theoretical bit I want to throw in. Oh, sure. There's a, there's a really, really good book from uh, early two thousands, which was called um, rules of play game design fundamentals. Mm, mm -hmm. It's by Solon and Zimmerman. It's a really, really sort of kind of widely cited text in game design. And they kind of talk about, um, player actions in a game and they need to meet kind of two criteria to be meaningful to players and for the, the events in the game to feel meaningful. And that is they need to be discernible and integrated. 
So in plain language, what does that mean, right? Right. So discernible means that when the players take an action, they have to be able to see the results of that action. And I think we've all maybe played not just video games, but board games or, or RPGs where you do something and then you have no idea if anything happened, right? You may have rolled the die, the DM may have said, okay, and then you just go to move on with the game. That's really frustrating because it's really difficult for players to know how they're having an impact on the world and if their strategies are successful or not successful and adjust accordingly if they have no idea, if they can't discern the effects of their action. And then, of course, integrated um, means they need to be able to see the ways in which their actions actually have a meaningful impact on the game and direct change the course and change their fate, right? And the reason I bring that up is because I feel like that's another way that traps fall down is if traps are triggered um, as a result of an action where the players weren't able to like discern, you know, what, what they were doing, or if it wasn't really clear how a previous action related. So we're the integration piece. I'll give you a great example for not from RPGs, but um, I've been reading some choose your own adventure books for a, for some research for a project I'm working on. Gotcha. And there's, I mean, there's, there's a neat little um, twist where instead of giving you like, you know, text options, like, okay, you're in a room. And if you want to open the left door, turn the page 55, you want to take the key. It's just like a little like arcade game, like game pad where you can do like left, right, up, down. Gotcha. Okay. And at first I was like, I was like, okay, this is, this is kind of a cool little conceit. But the problem was it was really unclear at, any given point, what actions those actually mapped to, right? So there was also like a jump and a sword button. Okay. And I remember a situation where the room, like the description, went through great lengths to describe like this heap of rubble in a tomb. Okay. And it was, it was, it was like a well nearby too, but it was like, oh, there's this heap and it's blocking your way. I'm like, I'm going to jump, baby. Let's jump over this thing. <laughs> so then I went, I, I, so I turned to the page next to the little jump icon and when I get to the page, it's okay. You, you jumped on top of the well and the wood on top of the well breaks and you fall and you die. I'm like, what the hell? Right. So, and so that goes back to that, like discernible, like I wasn't able to discern like what the result of my action was going to be. And when we get back to RPGs, I, I feel like that's, that's a lot of situations where players are like, wait, so how did I trigger this trap? Or how did something that I did two rooms ago, like how was I supposed to know that that was going to have an effect here? So Think about those two things as well as like if you have a trap and it's springing as a result of player action, as any trap should, right? It should always be a reaction to something the players did. Um, ask yourself, is, is it clear to the players or clear enough at least that when they're struck by the trap, it was a result of something that they did wrong, right? That it wasn't just like, oh, you couldn't have known two rooms ago <laughs> that if you would have turned this key, like this thing was going to happen to you later, um, so yeah, discern, discernible and integrated. Those are the two vocab words that I'm throwing at people. <laughs> I love that. I love that so much. Um, you know, and I love when we're able to to sort of introduce terminology that makes sense, especially when we're we're talking about these things and 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 the fact that we're able to relate it back to video games, I think is a big help. Or choose your own adventure books or anything like that that people know. Because I do think part of the reason we bring up Indiana Jones and Castlevania and all that kind of thing so much is because not only are they iconic references that everybody's going to get, the, the traps are fun, right? Like the, those traps in Indiana Jones are so memorable because those are super fun scenes. You get how they work. Everything makes sense. It's quick um, and it's challenging, right? Poor Alfred Molina didn't realize uh, when he had that idol that uh, he shouldn't have stepped into that beam of light, right? That you get great moments like that. Um, you talked about kind of thematically uh, how you can integrate traps and puzzles together. Talk to me a little bit more about that because one of the problems I have is I sit down and I'm like, okay, so I'm going to design this trap. I have the puzzle. It's ready to go. I'm like, okay, so and when the players mess up, uh, it shoots lightning. Like that's all I can ever come up with at first is like it's it's going to shoot a bolt of lightning and then I'll read other modules written by people like yourself who it's like, oh my God, this trap is amazing and it also totally makes sense with this puzzle. Like it thematically everything sort of gels together. How do you achieve that? Well, on the, on the puzzle side at least, um, one of the things that I tried to do when, when working out sort of this, this theory of puzzles is asking myself, what is, what is the value of a puzzle? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, like why, why, why do we, why do we include them? Why do we include them in games? 
And why is it that some puzzles seem to really resonate with folks? And why is it that others are super boring? Right. And for me, I feel like the value of a puzzle in a game like D&D, a dungeon delving game, is that it um, invites the players, rewards the players for engaging with the details and the lore um, of your world, right? And so one of the things that uh, I, I really, I really don't enjoy, and I'm very guilty of doing these things in my earlier adventures, were these things called checkout line puzzles, right? Which I'm kind of calling them checkout line puzzles. And you see them all the time. It's like, it's something that you could find in one of those 99 cent books by the gum at the Kroger, right? Okay. Where yeah, it's, yeah. it's like a Sudoku or a crossword, or it's, it's some kind of thing where it's this other sort of game that is sort of then dropped in front of you. And I was, uh, it didn't really occur to me at first, but actually I had some, a uh, couple of friends who, who came by, you know, earlier this summer and they're like, man, we just got out of a game and the puzzle was awful. And I was just thinking about that that day. So I said, well, explain to me, like, what, 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 what about it made you frustrated? Mm -hmm. And they said it was kind of this, it reminded me of this like algorithms textbook machine learning like problem where it's like, okay, if you have three um, couriers and one can move at like three squares Manhattan distance and the other one can do, <laughs> and, it, and, and it involved like a grid, like some weird sort of grid that the GM put together and immediately like all the players kind of tuned out. Oh, okay. and I said, well, and I said, well, what was the adventure about? And it was like, oh, it was like two rival elf bakeries. I'm like, hold the fuck up. Like, wait, so you have, <laughs> so you have a premise about cool elf bakeries, but then you're, you're doing like machine learning textbook. Like, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. And, and, and so, and I talked to some other people about their experience with puzzles and that was kind of the connecting thread. And, and, and so for me, to connect it to theory again, uh, what Rafe Koster talks about in theory of fun, like, like why, why are things fun? And things are fun because we, um, as humans get this sort of satisfaction of mastering something about, about um, completing patterns, right. And learning, learning about our environment. And, you know, for me, the most successful puzzles and the ones that I try to include in my adventures now, which get a really good response have nothing to do with like, you know, Sudoku or crosswords or word puzzles or math stuff. It's inviting the players to engage with some of the more out of the way details of, of the world. And then making just one sort of inferential leap or making one little bit of speculation and recognizing sort of how these, these elements of your dungeon fit together. And then they feel the sense of reward of like, Oh, like we figured this out. Right. Like we put the pieces together and we engage with something. We, we, we exercise mastery over the game we're playing. Cause I'll, I'll never forget what one of my buddies said. He's like, it was like we were playing D and D and then we stopped to play this completely other game. Right. That is usually right. played solo and is usually very boring. Right. Yes. And so, so for me, that's the value of puzzles and it, and it kind of fits nicely with um, kind of the whole idea of pillars where you have like combat and that really rewards that sort of tactical thinking, that moment by moment, you know, making your moves. And then you have role play, which is a bit more sort of theatric and that kind of thing. Um, and then you have puzzles, which is kind of the exploration pill, rewarding players for finding uh, details in your world and connecting the dots. And um, yeah, there's a couple of different kinds of puzzles that embody that. So things like um, part and whole, like match a wayward part to its whole, or, you know, um, work out a, a pattern like you might find specific clues throughout the dungeon and once you have them all together you can work out kind of what what the connecting thread is between them which allows you to then make sort of an inference about something else in the dungeon but basically it's it's that's that's like the number one thing i would implore people to do is really think about what their puzzle is doing if their puzzle is is rewarding the players for really just sort of nerding out that's really what it is it's inviting the players to go yeah read those runes, man, read that tome, go through there and really speculate and have that fun. But if it's more like trying to outsmart the players to kind of a weird, clever, like, Oh, I had this really cool word problem in my math book. <laughs> let, me just, let me just replace, you know, stuff with dwarves and, and throw it in there. Um, the, the players aren't going to find that rewarding because they're, they're not getting the pleasure of working out a pattern in your world or demonstrating mastery over it. But then once you have that, then you can put the trap in. Mm -hmm. And we talked last time about sort of 
how can you do stuff that's not just damage? Right. Yeah. And I might be able to use this. Maybe I'm going to announce something on your show tonight, man. I'm going to make an announcement. Here we go. First, first time you can hear it here. Yeah. So me and Ashley Warren are co-writing a book. Oh, nice. Yeah. That's awesome. It's called, yeah. And it is called Lamia Codex. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it'll be a little, a little bit. um, But the thrust of the book is it's monsters, traps, hazards, um, curses, and diseases, right? For fifth edition. Got it. Got it. Not, none of which deal any damage or do or, or kill the player. Okay. Okay. I'm so, it's, so basically it's how can we make these things dangerous and threatening without dealing damage or without saying like, oh, you're dead or imposing a condition. Right. 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 We've been thinking a lot about that. And there's a, a whole kind of big list of things. I might have mentioned it a little bit on um, the last episode I was on where I had this sort of list of ways that you can complicate the player's lives. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And a lot of it has to do with uh, threatening resources that they have, both tangible and intangible. Got it. And so um, I wish I could have, I don't think I have it handy right now, but, but the idea is you have things like you can worsen a danger further in the dungeon or you can um, increase the risk that the players uh, incur when using certain abilities. So not making them harder to use, but making like the cost of failure more, more dangerous. Right. Um, you can complicate a puzzle that already exists, or you can buff up a monster that already exists or summon new monsters, but there's all kinds of ways that the player's lives can be made a lot harder mm-hmm. beyond just dealing damage. And so that's something that, that we plan to explore in that book. But yeah, I think just for the, for the, for the listeners now, you know, I, I would invite them to sort of think about, the different sort of uh, of resources that their dungeon adventure presents, um, or the things that the players need uh, to do to be successful. Um, you can also let's say if an NPC that gives out I don't know hints, right? That's a resource, and you could have a trap where its effect is okay. Something happens where that NPC is no longer friendly. Gotcha. Because right? friend- friendship is a you know is a valuable resource for dungeoneers. And how that, how that kind of manifests is up to you. That's kind of where the creativity comes in where it's like, Oh, maybe they're like branded with a mark. And when the NPC sees that mark, that sort of turns them hot. You know what I mean? Like there's all kinds of things that you can do, um, you know, in, in the fiction of your game to, to, to make those things sort of, you know, real, but yeah, I mean, NPCs, you've got, you know, monsters, curses, diseases, like there's all kinds of things that you can do. Hey everyone, we're going to take a quick break and then back to the babble. Are you looking for a great story? Do you love Star Wars? Do you like podcasts? If you said yes to any of these, check out the Redemption Podcast. Well, I have less in my head than you do normally, probably. You haven't met the crew I'm with. Pretty much everywhere we go, our life is in danger. Things didn't explode. That's pretty sneaky for us. That sounds horrible. Yes, please finish up whatever underhanded thing you're doing on the computer terminals at the Jedi Temple. Check out Redemption Podcast at www.redemptionpodcast.com. Let's get back to the babble. So in thinking about uh, puzzles and in thinking about traps, I have to ask, uh, are you a fan or have you seen the Saw movies? I have. Yeah, okay. I've, seen, I've seen most of them. So let me uh, just, this is sort of a, what do you think of that style of trap as like an RPG trap? Um, You know, something that is very deadly. Uh, People are sort of put in these situations where they need to make a sacrifice to get out of the trap, as it were. Yeah. um, So I've always thought the song, I like like the first one. I didn't like any of the other ones. (laughs) Um, Sure, sure. That's very fair. (laughs) And I I think the reason for that um, is that, I, I kind of like the initial sort mm-hmm. of a poetic justice sort of theme in the first one where it was like, you know, Jigsaw was kind of taking folks who had taken something in their lives for granted. Right. 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 Exactly. Um, and, and there was even a line in one of the movies where he was like, everyone always gets a choice. Everyone always gets a chance. And then they kind of walk that back. And in the later movies, like there's all kinds of traps where everyone has to die. Like it's, <laughs> they kind of, they kind of walk that back, but I don't know. I've actually never really saw the saw movies as a really big source of inspiration. Cool. For, for, for traps, I mean, outside of, I think I like the setups for 
the scenes where it's like they kind of do like the quick cuts to the different kind of scary things in the room. Right, right. But, but beyond that, I mean, I feel like they're 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 very sort of like they're like their contrivances. Like the I guess the fun of those traps is kind of how complicated they are mechanically and all that sort of weird stuff. And then there's some sort of I don't know some sort of moral thing that has to happen, you know, where it's like you turn down all these people for health insurance and now, you know, someone else's life. Like, I don't know. I've never really found the introduction of moral dilemmas to be very satisfying in my own games. I just don't have any interest in it that much. Like I said, for me, I think the big value, kind of the real um, sort of the money behind traps in an RPG is really that, that lore bit honestly like it, and actually it's kind of weird i was talking to to somebody about it recently and they made this weird connection where it's like wow so from what you're telling me it sounds like traps are best used in story games i'm like ah, i mean maybe but <laughs> yeah i mean but the, the idea is really traps have to reward the players for engaging with the details of your world right and i just don't see the saw movies really being about that they're more about these sort of you know moral choices like which which of your interns are you going to kill i guess <laughs> right right yeah. yeah exactly exactly uh sure and and that makes sense and i think players probably take umbrage if it's just like hey you wake up and now you're in this terrible situation whereas it sounds like if if being in a terrible situation is the punishment for doing something incorrectly right then it's uh it makes more sense for the players it feels more earned for you to do something like that. Like, well, now you're in this situation where you're going to have to tear your leg off. Uh, but I didn't just make you wake up and be in there. I think is a, a good place to start too. And there's actually a trap like that in Testament of Malice. That's kind of to that point where there's like a, some sort of demon or imp where if it basically reduces you to zero hit points, it's going to claw one of your organs out. You got two hands. So you can only pick which two you want to shield out of three. Right. <laughs> um, but I, but I will say, I mean, kind of to, to a larger principle to what you just talked about, mm-hmm. I've, I've always really disliked just sort of as a player and a GM, though, those contrivances, those moments where it's like, I'm going to have to go ahead and, and sort of rule by GM fiat that you right. don't have X, Y, or Z ability. Right. Or that's, or that's some ability that, that you um that you have that you may have invested you know points or feats or whatever the whatever your game system offers like for me a a really well designed puzzle slash trap because in my mind they're kind of the same size of the same coin yeah should be encouraging and rewarding the players for investing in those abilities so that's like what even in like tomb of horrors where there's so many things where it's like you can't teleport through the walls. And if you do like a demon shows up and like, <laughs> augury fails, like for me, so for me, maybe that's helpful, especially if you're running kind of a higher level game. And I've done this with some of my cold press stuff is I'll look at the spell lists and right. go, okay, what spells do characters have at this level? And then rather than being like, well, can't have them flying, strike that out. Can't have them teleport and strike that out. Like, okay, what, what are some ways that I can reward the players for using those abilities and using them in the service of learning more about my world. So maybe mm-hmm. instead of shutting down teleport, maybe I'll create a room that can really only be accessed through teleportation that reveals some interesting secret about my dungeon, some interesting piece of the lore or history. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because again, it's, it's about fun is about mastery and it's about, you know, again, being able to, to use the abilities that you have and feel smart about the choices that you've made and the resources that you've spent and, and exploration is a lot of fun. And so it's cool to kind of find something that's sort of off the beaten path and have that sort of moment of like, oh, okay, I can finally see how these things are connected. And that gives me enough knowledge where I can start, what do they call it in like heist, like synthesis, like different kinds of learning, you know? It's like, okay, I, I'm now synthesizing. I'm taking different pieces of information that I know about the dungeon and then making a conjecture. And when that conjecture proves true and you know the gem it's sucked into the slot and the door opens and they see all the magic items like that's and that's what it's all about (laughs) (laughs) so so that's and so to kind of go back to the whole like saw bit i mean players i think in my experience largely resent those kind of contrivances especially with traps you know and grimtooth did this a lot in my at least in my opinion a lot where it was like well there's this area but 
this ability doesn't work because we said so, and this ability doesn't work because we said so. And, and, and players don't feel like players don't like feeling that their abilities aren't useful. And so, yeah, if you want to, if you want to put them in a spot, do so as a punishment, but don't, don't open with them chained up. Yeah. I, I love that design philosophy of, you know, can you, instead of taking away the things that, you know, are awesome about being, you know, a fifth level wizard, um, can you play to that in some way and like reward the use of those things? Because I, and I think a lot of what you're talking about is the difference between like, uh, being a dungeon master or a designer uh, at the beginning versus, you know, a couple of years down the road. Like it has taken me forever to learn some of the things you're talking about. And some of the things I'm learning just through talking to you, right? Like the other, I want to say a couple months ago, put a, like a weird Sudoku puzzle. And it was like, this doesn't feel right. And the play testing came back of like, ah, this feels out of place and stuff. And now I, yeah, don't do it, man. You know, I, I totally understand why yeah. though. And, it, and it, you're right. It is like, you came to play D&D, and if you're suddenly playing Sudoku, uh, that feels lame. I would hate that, you know? And I put it because I was like, well, there should be a puzzle here, right? Um, and I came up with something better. And I've done that. I mean, I'm super... I mean, that's kind of how I was able to learn this stuff was just making those mistakes kind of over and over again. Um, but it's difficult because, I mean, even in a lot of stuff that still kind of comes out today... I mean, the examples of puzzles that we see are kind of what I'm calling the checkout line puzzles. It's like some kind of word puzzle or some kind of, you know, rid riddles are actually really tough. Um, there's a, another, another book um, kind of in the same vein as, as Rules of Play, but much more recent called Players Making Decisions by Zach High Highwiller. Mm -hmm. And he, I forget who he quotes, but he, he was like, what, what is a puzzle, right? And really the definition he used was uh, a puzzle is fun and it has a right answer. <laughs> and that doesn't That's sound it. like much, but when you kind of sit with it, it kind of sort of makes more sense. Like, well, it's fun. So that kind of gets to what we were talking about of like, well, what's fun about sitting down and playing D and D right. And D and D is not fun and you can't use any of your abilities or your spells and there's nothing to explore, you know, but has a right answer means that, and people can fudge on this, that there, that there is a solution to be worked out that it's not necessarily something that you might see in a more sort of free form storytelling game where the players encounter a puzzle, but they're not really solving the puzzle. It's sort of like the, the backdrop to a story that they're telling with each other. Right. So it's sort of like whatever they say, I mean, they'll end up solving it. That's a foregone conclusion. Um, but in, in, in a more sort of strict game design sense, um, puzzles have some kind of right answer. Right. But, and, but then he starts talking about, uh, Zach Highwiller talks about some kinds of puzzles that aren't very fun and he, he brings riddles in. And I think riddles suffer the same uh, fate of things like, like Sudokus or crosswords or word puzzles where um, the players can't, what he called, move toward the solution with reasoned effort. And what that means is like, okay, like if a player doesn't know a riddle, then they don't know it. And that's pretty much it. And the same with like, I'm extremely bad at Sudoku. I'm, that's why I call it out all the time. Cause I hate it. <laughs> I'm so bad at it. But that's the thing is like, there's, there's no, there's no amount of, there's like, if, if I'm presented with this or if it's a word puzzle, if I don't know what like the hook or the gimmick is, then there's no way for me to move towards a solution. Now players or GMs can fudge that a little bit and say, well, maybe I'll let you roll an int thing, but that's always kind of a, a cop out. But when you're doing puzzles that are more about like, basically you need to explore the world, you need to explore the dungeon and sort of find different little bits of information, then the players can do what Zach Highwiller calls moving toward the solution with reasoned effort. Because you can always go, you know what, I don't really know how to solve this puzzle right now, but there's probably other information in the world that if I just find another scroll or another tapestry or something else, um, or, or take advantage of some of my spells or go talk to NPCs. Like you can move towards a solution and you'll get there. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's kind of that, that brick wall feeling so many people experience when they realize like, Oh, this is a puzzle. Like, Oh no. <laughs> and <laughs> like to go back to my buddy, he said he just got up and did the dishes. <laughs> so, <laughs> which for me, it's like, that's a total failure. Like you don't want anybody getting up to do the dishes. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
I often think about escape rooms, right? Are kind of like yeah. dungeons in that sense, in that like if there's a puzzle you're working on in an escape room and you can't figure out what to do next, there's still other things to explore, other things to look at, that kind of thing. Part of the thing that makes puzzles and by extension traps kind of kind of annoying is when they're placed in these spots where there there, there is no forward progress. So and in my mind, really, puzzles should only be placed in two ways. Uh, the first is to guard um, optional secrets or rewards, right? So it's something that the players don't have to overcome to complete the adventure. But if they kind of make the effort or if they have that flash of inspiration or insight, they can get some extra reward. Or to sort of guard like um, like the final, it's like a big meta puzzle that you can always kind of come back to, right? So it does block progress, but like you have the entire adventure to sort of put it all together. It's really straightforward. Or if it really, really is like, I I want the players to sort of encounter this puzzle. Like they have to move through this puzzle area to proceed, allow them to sort of bust their way through um, with some kind of sacrifice, right? Like, like there, it's a, it's a worse option for them. It's like, okay, you know what? We're not going to solve this puzzle. We just want to, sort of take a mulligan on it, right? And just go through. But but that's going to cost them a significant resource. But at no point, again, outside of that one kind of last little, you know, usually easy sort of meta puzzle, like, oh, we've collected all three of these, you know, gems and they put into the final portal that goes to the boss fight. Um, puzzles should never stop forward progress. Otherwise, you're going to have a situation where it's like, okay, well, one person knows how to do this. We can't go anywhere else. We can't do anything else. I want to say... Um, there was a, a book on sort of architecture and game design that I read not too long ago. And it referenced Dark Souls a bunch, which I was happy about. But I, I want to say one of, one of the design principles, I don't know if it was Dark Souls or a similar game, which was always have like three sort of avenues to explore. Like there should always be, if, if the players come to a dead end or can't really overcome a challenge, like there should be at least two other things that they can go and make some progress on. So I think I think that rings true for puzzles as well. Yeah, I think that's great because the other thing that I love about puzzles is that you they're going in the back of your mind, right? So like if you've encountered one and it's like okay, there you know that, something's behind that door, we got to figure out how to get that door. We don't uh, we're, it's clear we don't have everything we need yet. There's way more of this dungeon to explore. As you're picking up on things and as you're finding things, you know, you're you as the player are saying to yourself like, oh, OK, so maybe this works with this. Right. But in the meantime, I'm also fighting skeletons and rescuing prisoners or whatever it is that there is also to do in the dungeon. And so that is really cool. And I think the other thing that's fun about that is like there's this moment of uh, we're looking at this tapestry and now we're wondering does this like, is this part of the puzzle? Is this not the danger of like, well, I found this gem. Do I, do I put this gem in the slot? You know what I mean? Like there's that, uh, that questionableness that can help enhance the alien and, and dangerous feel of the dungeon too, because it sticks with you even when you're not in the room where the puzzle is. Yeah. And, and one of the things that, um, people might, be a little leery about is they might have uh, an experience with maybe an older edition of D and D where they had a GM that ran it, where it became very sort of pixel hunty, you know, where it's like, yes. well, you didn't like turn the key three times to the right and then two to the left. Um, one of the ways that I've found helpful to avoid that is if I have some kind of uh, item in the game that's meant to convey some sort of knowledge about a puzzle, like a tapestry, right. For example, I ask myself, okay, what, what, what is the what are the likely ways in which the players are going to interact with this thing? So they'll probably read it, they'll probably feel the material, and they'll probably maybe pull it to the side to see if there's something behind it, right? And so if you stick to those things, like that really helps avoid sort of that that sort of pixel huntiness. Because really, I mean, your your goal as a GM is not with puzzles to outsmart the players. Right. It's your goal is not to make something that's so clever. <laughs> um, really, really what it is, is your goal is to provide them with incentives to really dig into, to not just sort of speed run through your dungeon, but really dig in and be like, okay, well, wait a minute. We saw these same images on this tapestry, but not on this tapestry. What does that mean? Right. When you get your players asking, what does that mean? What is that all about? That's helpful. Um, 
so yeah, I'd usually just like make a list. Like if it's a statue, like, well, they'll probably touch the statue or try to like move it or rotate it or press on different parts of it. Um, they're probably, you know, back to the tapestry example, they're probably not going to try to taste it. But that actually can be, if you telegraph that earlier in the dungeon, that can be a way for you to put a unique twist on your adventure. You know what I mean? So that's, so that's what I usually is like, make that list of like, what are they probably going to do and sort of stick to that. But if you get that flash of inspiration, like, well, what if I, what if tasting the tapestry is the key here? Okay. Then what can I do earlier in the adventure to sort of indicate that that's something that they might want to do? Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think that makes perfect sense because I do think one reason there is this idea about canceling out teleportation and puzzled uh, the checkout line puzzles and that kind of thing comes from the fact that older editions of D and D did have a lot of that because I think people were trying to figure out how to make D and D work still at that point. Right. Everybody was a inexperienced designer, even Gary Gygax in many ways. So, and there was a little bit more of this, adversarial feel to the game too when it came to the dungeon master um you know things things have definitely changed uh with that respect and i just i think it's really cool one of the things that i run into sometimes is do you think it's okay for dungeons to have the hint that helps the 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 player characters through right like so we're we're talking about the tapestry you know and it's like hey there's something on there that helps them figure out the puzzle sometimes i get the players like well why would the wizard leave you know a clue about the trap here or that kind of thing and it's gotten easier to explain in the digital age with people like leaving their passwords everywhere and having hints to get their password reminded to them and that kind of thing like People forget, you know, if you're if you're a lich, you've got a, three death trap dungeons, right? And it's, you've got to clean it out every now and then. So you've left yourself these clues. Um, you know, do, do you ever run into that kind of thing of like, how do I justify the fact that there is a hint here? I never justify anything. Yes. Never. Yes. Yeah. No, I mean, it's. That's that's my usual answer on every episode that I come on. Um, <laughs> but I love that because I th- I think it's so true, right? Like, who cares as long as it's fun? Yeah, I mean that's that's exactly right. I mean there are there are kinds of puzzles that can feel a bit more a bit more natural. Um, I'll give an example of one that I was kind of working on, where there's um, sort of a shrine in the center of the dungeon, and if the players enter it in a certain way, they get like zapped by some divine lightning, and that's the end of them, right? But there are, I was inspired by this chapter in another book called An Architectural Approach to Game Design, all kinds of bibliography stuff going on today. Um, But it talked about, and I don't know anything about architecture and I didn't really until reading this book, but it talked about how a lot of classical architecture was made for um, populations who were illiterate. And so the reason that a lot of classical structures have things like mosaics and pictures and pillars and those sorts of things is that it was meant to communicate the stories about that culture to a population that couldn't read. And so in my mind, I'm like, well, in this sort of divinely themed dungeon, um, there will probably be all kinds of pictorial references, pictorial stories about the shrine. And so then I started to put in little hints where it was like, okay, there was a very specific holy symbol that you know the priestesses were wearing like if they looked closely at these mosaics they could see oh every single one of these priestesses or you know like ash ash maidens or things like that if we notice that in every single mural that we've seen in this dungeon the detail that's the same is that they're all wearing this specific little symbol or they have it drawn on them and so the puzzle is if you just go ahead and draw that symbol on yourself like your forehead or your neck or something like that you can walk into the temple unharmed got it that's awesome. So, so, yeah. So again, it's like, it's, 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 it's difficult to, I don't know, give like a whole, like, here's the one, two, three step-by-step thing to making puzzles that, that, that feel like they're natural. Like I think just, I mean, by its very nature, I think dungeon adventures are in some ways, like they're a game, like they're a contrivance they're an obstacle course, but I mean, there can definitely be ways. Um, I always call it like Lord of the Rescue. Like just, hey, look to the lore of your dungeon and the history and just find a way to reward the players for engaging uh, with those details. And um, it may not necessarily have to be a physical lock and a key. It may be, um, you know, some other, some other thing that's blocking the player's progress. 
if we're looking at then the obstacle course of the dungeon and, and we have all of these things in there, how do you also play uh, with with monsters? Do you think like monsters are a big part of, uh, let's say, you know, death trap dungeons or tournament dungeons? Are traps more important? Do they work hand in hand? I think they work hand in hand. Um, so as I mentioned, really two of the three placement sort of options for traps that I think work best are in tandem with monsters. You know, they, they can function similar to hazards. And in my mind, many traps and hazards are sort of the same, right? Like whether it's a dart swarm or it's a pit of lava, like they're kind of doing the same thing, which is complicating the player's tactics or making the choke point perilous to cross. It is, I think it might be possible to write a dungeon that is like all traps and no monsters. <laughs> But I've, uh, I've I've not been brave enough to do something like that yet. I don't know. It's, it's tough because you're right. Like you have modules like Tomb of Horrors that were very explicit about, you know, there really aren't that many monsters here. And But then like even my own stuff tends to focus more on these sort of like set piece arenas where monsters really do take center stage. But also, you know, we're, we're kind of remembering back to what I had said earlier, like one of the things that you want to include monsters in your Death Trap Dungeon for um, if for no other reason is to give you another vector to make the player's lives more complicated. So now, okay, I have a dungeon that's full of monsters. Maybe there's like a really big monster, like a mummy in the middle of it. I've now given myself something to work with, something to, to, to adjust as the players trigger traps. So there may, now I have a mummy. So now I can put a trap at the beginning of my dungeon that inflicts some kind of curse. And that curse makes that character vulnerable to the mummy spells, right? So I've given myself sort of a vehicle by which I can build trap effects that make the player's lives more complicated and more perilous um, that aren't just like dealing damage. And, And every monster, every group of monsters, I mean, you can do, you can make them worse. You can buff them, give them new abilities, move them around. Um, Really anything that you want to do with monsters can be the result of a traps effect. Does that make sense? Right. Yes. And that's the same with like with uh, diseases and curses and all of these really sort of nasty things that the dungeoneers are going to encounter. You know, a real good death trap dungeon has a diversity of challenges, not just traps because the traps need something to riff off of. The traps need something that they can interact with. Like, Ooh, I have a trap and I can make this disease more dangerous or I can make this curse more dangerous or I can put, I can move this monster from here to here or give it a new ability or, you know, all sorts of things that you can do with traps to alter the state of the other things in your dungeon. Does that make sense? Totally. Yes, absolutely. And it, and it does make it more dynamic, right? The thing about tomb of, horrors right is uh if you were playing it tournament style when it was first released you had a time limit and so time pressure uh much like in an escape room right that's the thing that keeps you moving forward otherwise you could brute force your way through almost every puzzle in every escape room ever right um same thing in tomb of horrors or is that you would be able to especially now, right? A lot of people don't play that with a time limit. They play it as, okay, we're running Tomb of Horrors and everybody's just pressing every surface with a 10-foot pole as they slowly creep forward. Um, You know, it it becomes a more dynamic thing if there's a hallway and you're being chased by a monster down it, right? Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's one of the fundamentals of of decision-making in in, in any kind of game, not just RPGs, but there needs to be some kind of... uh, exigence exigency right yes like in yes. any game that you're playing there's there's something that you need to be doing mm-hmm. that prevents you from just sort of standing yeah and just thinking forever about what you're going to do this is great sursa uh i i would love uh for you to come back and we could talk more about like diseases and curses and stuff because i think those are pretty tricky sometimes too especially when it's like okay this one gives a condition uh all right now what, what's next you know that kind of thing so and they can be so much more interesting than that you can really have a lot of fun uh even even getting them i, I, I when i'm a player i kind of relish getting a curse because it's like what's gonna happen to me you know this is fun well cur- and especially because curses and diseases are so um intricately sort of intimately linked mm-hmm. with, with with um traps and puzzles and so, like, I've been doing some work on curses as well and kind of defining what those different 
what different kinds of curses you can get. So there's like curses of vulnerability, yes. which sort of <laughs> increase, increase the peril, right? Um, but then you have curses of power. And I think those are, are, are quite interesting where, you know, I like to avoid as a GM and as a designer, just sort of making the player's abilities less likely to be successful. I like to sort of make the consequences of failure worse. Mm -hmm. Um, But also with curses, especially um, you present that risk reward decision of, you know, the curse gives you some kind of tremendous power. I mean, the canonical example is the the ring of power, right? The the invisibility ring, Lord of the Rings. Like, yeah, you can use that and it's going to give you this amazing power and visibility, but it's going to corrupt you. So you have to make a choice. Like, do I want to use the ring's ability now knowing that I'm, I'm putting myself uh, at risk. And so, yeah, there's all kinds of ways that you can, you know, take things like curses and diseases and put them in conversation with the other parts of your dungeon. And again, it all comes back to, to what's fun about playing D&D and what's fun is using your abilities and doing cool stuff. And if there's anything in your game that clamps down on those things, then you got to really ask yourself, are we, am I inviting players to play D&D? Because my expectation when I sit down is I'm going to have spells and magic weapons and all kinds of cool stuff. And if the GM goes, okay, cool. And now they're all gone by what, by then in what sense are we playing D and D now we're just talking to each other. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. Well, we will bring you back cause we're going to delve more into that. Uh, but uh, in the meantime, where can people find you on the internet? Yeah. So um, my website is service of victory.com. That's where I post. Um, about all the stuff I'm working on, uh, including my upcoming book for the DMs Guild Tournament Dungeon Handbook. You can also learn about things uh, like the RPG Writer Workshop that I am an instructor for. And in fact, I will be um, launching a uh, standalone online course called Dungeon Design Essentials, where I really kind of do a deep dive into some of the stuff that we've talked about tonight and in other episodes. Oh, nice. That's awesome. Go check that out. RPG Writer Workshop is incredible. Uh, So if you're thinking about RPGs or want to learn more, there are so many great instructors there, uh, including Cersa. So go check it out. Well, I think that's going to be it. Uh, We'll have you back. We're going to talk more about curses and stuff. Thank you so much for joining me on Tabletop Apple today. I appreciate that. Oh, thank you, James. It's always fun. What a great conversation with Cersa Victory. That dude seriously knows a ton. You know, people, if tabletop babble is a good part of your life, something that you look forward to every week and listen to, I would ask that you consider throwing a few bucks our way if you are able. Head over to patreon.com slash intracasso. It's patreon.com slash intracasso. There's all kinds of rewards there, more content from me, a monthly survey where you can vote on topics for the show. But really, it's about supporting a thing that has come to mean a lot in your life. This show is not cheap to make. Uh, It costs a lot of time and it costs a lot of money. So if you are interested in uh, helping be a part of that process, helping decide the direction of shows through surveys, head on over to patreon.com slash intracasso, I-N-T-R-O-C-A-S-O. And hey, if you're already donating, thank you so much. Or if you can't, but you listen, thank you for that anyway. You are amazing and I'm so glad to have your ears. One thing you could do for free is head on over to iTunes, leave us a five-star review. I will read it out loud. You can make me say anything you want, anything at all. For instance, there is a review here from David Mathman that reads, Hey people, put this podcast in your ear hole and give it a listen. It's a short and sweet review. It's actually entitled Review. David Mathman, thank you so much for this review. I truly, truly appreciate it. All right, people, you can find me on Twitter at James Intracasso. That's at J-A-M-E-S-I-N-T-R-O-C-A-S-O. You can also check out all the game design stuff I'm doing, the worlds I'm building, and more over at worldbuilderblog.com. Top Babble is a show on the Don't Split the Podcast Network. Thanks to Rudy Basso for founding with me. Our theme music, which you're listening to right now, was provided by Battle Bards. Don't forget that RPGs are like sex.
Hey everybody, this podcast you are listening to it was brought to you by D&D Beyond. D&D Beyond, they are the official digital tool set and game companion for Dungeons & Dragons. I've been talking about them for a while, and they are constantly improving. They have an encounter builder that's an alpha. They have all kinds of free content for you to test or use for your games. I wrote a series of articles about them that I think you should go check out. It's all about how to homebrew stuff using D&D Beyond. So it walks you through step-by-step step how to do it, but then also how to get your creative juices flowing, how to uh, make something that is balanced. So go check those out. They're on dndbeyond.com. And hey, if you like using it, if you like checking it out, maybe consider paying for their awesome character builder, some of their adventures, whatever it is that you have got a need for, they can help you out. So go check it out, dndbeyond.com.